Good morning, everyone, and happy Sunday to you all. We'll start with our gathering song, Lo, the Earth Awakes Again. John Miglietta, and I've been coming to this congregation for about 30 years. Currently, I'm a member of the Board of Trustees, but have worn many hats while I've been here. Among my favorite was as a youth group leader for many years. Welcome to this virtual service of the, United, of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury. We are so glad that each of you are able to join us this morning and together in community, we can ensure that social distancing does not mean social disengagement. Our weekly services are more than just a gathering of our physical bodies, it is the forming of a sacred time that we make together. Whether you are well-versed in the technology of teleconferencing or this is your first venture, we welcome you. Whatever the faith and traditions of your past, whatever your theological stance, whatever your heritage, whoever you are, and whomever you love, we welcome you. You can learn more about us on our website and Facebook page. We encourage you to share our Facebook page and to reach out to others who may be isolated at this time and might benefit from the spiritual connection with, that is typically available by walking through our open doors on Sunday morning. Here is the point where I'm allowed to share a little bit about my journey to UU. And anyone who knows me is fully aware that I'm never one to let a captive audience go to waste. I come from a Catholic background and my wife was a sixth generation UU. So right there, there was a point of negotiation. Before we were married, I spent an Easter with her family. This might have been my very first exposure to a UU service. And it was very different from the Catholic experience that I had had to that point. The things that I remember most distinctly is that the appearance and the messenger messages were entirely different. There wasn't purple bunting draped everywhere as I was accustomed to. Instead, there were flowers everywhere. There were tulips and daffodils. It was a riot of color. All the ladies and the girls had hats on, all similarly, similarly decorated in springtime themes. The message was one of springtime and rebirth and hope. As this was in New Hampshire and snow was still on the ground, it might have been just a bit premature, but no matter. When the service was over 
all the ladies and the girls with their hats got up, paraded around the sanctuary and led the way to coffee hour in the fellowship hall to the heirs of Irving Berlin's Easter parade. It was uplifting in ways that the Catholic services that I had, had experienced at that point just never achieved. Oh, wow. So that's when my eyes were open to the possibilities of UUism. To be sure, it was probably further 10 years before I joined this congregation, but the seeds were planted that Easter Sunday. Again, welcome to the UU Congregation of Danbury, where we welcome all in the spirit of compassion, inquiry, and service. I would like to bring to your attention the announcements in the order of service. The young adults of UUCD will meet today at noon via Zoom. Please contact Sequoia Lowe if you need more information. Sam McCoy's workshop on Black Voices of the 20th Century will continue tomorrow night, Monday, at 7 p.m. Please contact Sam again for more information. And also on Monday night at 7, the Spiritually Speaking Group will meet via Zoom. For more information, please contact Joe Gelati. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter to you. It is so good to be with you this morning. I'm just adjusting my screens here so I can actually see at least some of your faces. Most of you will have read or heard the news by now that I will only be with you as your minister through this coming July. I am so sad about that, but I'm also so grateful for the three years that we've had together. And if you didn't see my note, it should be in your e-news um, from UUCD. My family and I will be moving to another Eastern state for me to be the next full-time settled minister of a UU congregation there. Details about that will be forthcoming once they're all sorted out. All of this means that I am even more focused than I would otherwise be on enjoying today, this day, just as it is. It is good to be with you. It is good to have journeyed through this bizarre pandemic experience with you. It is good to be continually exploring and doing what we can to bring about the more just world we all dream of. Let this Sunday morning time always be a way that we get reconnected, recentered, regrounded in this loving and enduring congregation. Come, let us worship together. Please bring a candle or chalice close by now and join me in lighting your chalice and then in our chalice lighting words. Love is the spirit of this congregation and justice is its light. This is our covenant to dwell together in peace to seek and speak the truth in love, to help one another and celebrate life. Good morning. Indeed, it is good to be together. I have no religious education announcements for you this morning. Just a welcome and a very happy Easter to all those who celebrate. Yesterday, we had an Easter egg hunt and played some games outside the congregation's buildings, and it was so, so wonderful to be together with those kids and teens and parents who could make it. You can see some pictures of it on your screen. What a precious thing to be with one another, the sun shining brightly on our heads, an everyday sort of miracle. Let's say together our children's affirmation, the words for which are printed in your order of service. We are Unitarian Universalists. We are people with open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. We care for the earth and each other. Thank you so much, Sierra Marie. I'm excited to share this story with you this morning, Hurry and the Monarch. 
This story highlights for me the ways that we each experience change and transformation in our own ways, at our own pace, in our own unfolding life stories. This is the case with animals as well as human beings. The monarchs that make the journey to Mexico normally can live up to eight months or more. The spring and summer generations live the usual butterfly lifespan between four and six weeks. This is very different from the lifespan of the other character in this story, the land tortoise. A slow moving reptile that carries its home on its back the tortoise is a very old life form, older even than the dinosaur. It can live up to 100 years or more, a total contrast to the short, busy life of the monarch butterfly. So this is Hurry and the Monarch by Anton O. Flatarta, illustrated by Myla So. Hurry the tortoise is starting to think about winter when out of the bright October sky, a monarch butterfly lands on his back. What do you call this place? Asks the monarch. Wichita Falls, says Hurry, and that's my back you're standing on. Wichita Falls, not far enough, says the monarch. Not far enough for what? Asks Hurry. For staying, replies the monarch. With that, the monarch opens her wings and flies off Hurry's back. I level with Hurry now. The monarch seems fascinated with the old tortoise. How long have you been here? Asks the monarch. Seems like forever, says Hurry. Maybe one day you'll break out of that shell, grow wings and fly away, says the monarch. I doubt it, says Hurry. It happened to me, replies the monarch, thinking about that extraordinary morning when she first opened her wings. Where did this happen? asks Hurry. Far away in a place called Canada, in a garden just like this. Why did you leave? asks Hurry. The days got colder, says the monarch. What do you do when the days get colder? Sleep answers Hurry. Cold days always change back into warm days if you wait. I don't have time for that, says the monarch, flying away from the garden. She joins more monarchs. They turn the sky orange as they continue their journey south towards Sweetwater. Back in the garden, a cloud passes over the sun and Hurry shuts his eyes as the old tortoise begins to dream, the monarch travels on, resting at night in places you would expect a butterfly to rest, and sometimes in places you would not. And they're landing on barbed, resting on barbed wire there in the bottom part of the picture. Each new day brings new sights. Sometimes a day brings danger. But the monarch survives, flying now toward Eagle Pass, then over the waters of the Rio Grande into Mexico. On and on she flies until finally, one November evening, she finds it, the warm green forest she has been searching for. She hangs from a bough, adding her tired wings to the soft murmur of a million others. Spring returns to Hurry's garden. He slowly opens his eyes and feels the warmth of the sun. Never fails, thinks Hurry. Then one morning, the monarch also returns. So where are you going now, asks Hurry. Back to the beginning, answers the monarch. Do you mean Canada, asks Hurry. Possibly, says the monarch. Butterflies can be infuriatingly mysterious, thinks Hurry, watching the monarch lay eggs on a milkweed plant. Then she flies away. 
In the town of Stillwater, she flies in through an open window and thinks it might be nice to rest her worn wings for a while in the folds of a sun-colored curtain. For a while becomes forever. Back in the garden over by the milkweed plant, Hurry sees a newborn caterpillar. Hello, says Hurry but the caterpillar doesn't answer. They are too busy eating the milkweed leaves. Hurry watches and waits as the caterpillar grows, shedding skin after skin, then crawling away to hide under a twig. But this garden is Hurry's whole world and there is little in it that is hidden from him. In the weeks that follow, Hurry sees an amazing transformation happen right in front of his still and patient eyes. A new monarch emerges from the shell, wet and wrinkled. For a while, they cling to their empty shell, waiting for their wings to expand and dry in the warm sunshine. After a few hours, the monarch spreads their strong new wings and flies toward Hurry, landing on his back. What do you call this place? asks the monarch. Here we go again, says Hurry, as the monarch opens their wings and flies off Hurry's back. What's your hurry? asks Hurry. I'm off to see the world. What do you think it's like? asks the butterfly. I imagine, says Hurry slowly, I imagine that it's like my garden, a place full of astonishing things. I can't wait, says the young monarch, flying away. Thus ends our story. Let us move now into a time of sharing our own stories, milestones, and life changes. Please write in the chat those personal milestones that are lifting up your heart or weighing it down today. And please do reach out and offer your support to one another, whether by chatting with everyone or privately.
Good morning, my name is Gary Mummert. I currently serve on Team Green and on the Buildings and Grounds team. Now being a member here for about 10 years, I can say that I'm truly happy to share my gifts and my financial resources. And here are the reasons. I'll be brief. First of all, as a man, this congregation allows me to be vulnerable. It provides for me a sense of community where I can share my values similarly with friends and members here. Programs here encourage me to live out our principles. Indeed, I'm encouraged to see that these are dynamic principles, not fixed. And finally, to be trite, uh, UUCD allows me to use my heart for social justice efforts, my mind, what's left of it, and my hands for making our property reasonably pleasant for staff and attendees. Now, my passion in retirement is to serve, and in this way, I can give back to the universe of people, some still with us, who grew this opportunity right here in Danbury. Taking care of what we've been given and helping to manage this complex feels important to me. I like solving problems, building things, repairing things. This occupies my mind and keeps me focused in the here and now. I do have some hopes for UUCD. While I respect and appreciate all of those who put our Sunday services together, I would like to see us experiment with more contemporary programming. I think there are some things that we could try that would be attractive to the wider community. I'd also like to see the culture of UUCD adapt so that every person here would be encouraged to grow their soul here with us, offering their various gifts. We get back more than we give and charting where each wants to grow and how to get there. Every one of us can have a ministry, and I trust that as we move to more t normal times, I hope, we will remember to focus on what will bring more meaning to our lives and to our communities. We all can make a difference. Thank you. Gary, we thank you for all the work you do, particularly the work on our grounds, which are beautiful. Thank you so much. And now is the time in the service for us to, uh, to give. And if you're a first time visitor here, um, we're very happy that you've joined us, joined us this morning and we invite you to pass the plate on. 
For our members and our friends, you can share your contribution by clicking the link that will be posted in the chat. You can also send a check to UUCD at 24 Clapboard Ridge Road. And we thank you so much for doing your part to sustain us. Now, please join me in the congregational response. In the spirit of compassion and service, we dedicate these, our offerings. With some uh, hesitancy, I'm going to share with you this story of a time where I was surprised by something that I did not think was what I wanted. This is a, uh, for church leaders among you, this is a thing not to do, <laughs> because someday a minister might share with another congregation about it. All right. Three years ago next month, I was sitting inside a small congregation in New England inside their social hall. It was a weekday evening. We were well into May's monthly board meeting and the treasurer handed around copies of a draft budget for the coming church year. I hadn't seen it yet, so I was glad to get a close look at it. And as my eyes scrolled down the page, I was shocked to see my line, the line for consulting minister of the congregation zeroed out. Like literally all it said on that budget line was consulting minister zero. Uh, what? It was May, 2018. I shared my surprise and was told a couple of things. Oh, we thought you knew this was where we were headed. We can't afford professional ministry anymore. And oh, didn't so-and-so call you about this? Yeah, no was all I could say. And then members of this board had the nerve to ask me what they should do next. And I was like, well, you should talk to your UUA regional staff person. And I think I'll pack up my stuff and head out now. And I gathered up my things and walked to my car and started the hour long drive home. Somewhere along the way, I realized I just had the experience that a great many people in this country have had of being downsized laid off, let go. Doesn't usually happen in quite that way in uh, the parish ministry world, but so be it. I had experienced that now. And while the congregation would and did pay me through the end of my contract with them that June, still I felt something of what it must be like to be abruptly told today's your last day. 
I remember that I drove all the way home before realizing that in my emotional shock and haste, I had left my laptop plugged in on the stage of the church's fellowship hall. So I drove back another hour to get my laptop and then drove home again. And then it was probably, you know, midnight at least now, I emailed Reverend Keith Cron, director of our transitions office, to let him know I'd be looking for another part-time consulting ministry and was fully aware that it was a little late in the search season for me to be jumping into search. But here I was, half-time parish minister in Connecticut, seeking a half-time ministry somewhere within driving distance of West Hartford, Connecticut, where I live. Was there any possibility of something working out? Simultaneously, I have since learned this congregation, UUCD, had been going through a tough spring search process yourselves. I understand now that some folks had suggested in the fall of 2017 that perhaps the congregation should consider part-time ministry, but many others in the congregation had felt that that wouldn't work, that the congregation was used to full-time ministry and needed to have a full-time minister. So the search team had tried their best, but was not able to find someone willing and able to relocate to Fairfield County for what the congregation could financially offer. And so in that spring of 2018, Keith and the transitions office team worked on convincing UUCD leadership at the time that a halftime minister might work out after all. And I was thrilled by the opportunity to serve a much more lively, dynamic, and healthy congregation than the very small one that had so suddenly let me go. Which is all to say, sometimes changes that do not seem to be at all what one wanted or expected initially can become opportunities for growth, for a good next step forward, for a new way of being to unfold that one would not have chosen. Now, let me be very clear. I have not ever been someone myself who believes that everything happens for a reason. I personally just don't buy it. Some events are just tragic and there is no good reason for them in my theological perspective, from my theological perspective. I also don't like the expression, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Sometimes I've found it's a very close call, <laughs> but I have experienced enough upset in my life and I am so lucky and privileged in my life as it is today that I am able to look back and say, well, maybe everything I've been through has helped me to appreciate what I have now. I also once had a Catholic chaplain colleague and friend who often said, don't ask God for patience. Life will teach you patience all on its own. And I would say the same thing for gratitude. Almost any time I can reorient myself into an attitude of gratitude, I find that I have a long, long list of things to be grateful for. Most days I am grateful just to be alive and to get to experience all the complexities of being a human being in this chaotic and beautiful world. If I can just remember to tap into that gratitude. Shifting from feeling tossed about by the winds of the world to intentionally twirling with the wind is a major but subtle shift indeed. In Atul Gawande's 2014 bestseller, Being Mortal, he writes, no one ever really has control. Physics and biology and accident ultimately have their way on our lives, but we are not helpless either. Courage is the strength to recognize both realities. We have room to act, to shape our stories, though as time goes on, it is within narrower and narrower confines. The chance to shape one's story is essential to sustaining meaning in life. 
So here we are now on this Easter Sunday 2021 at another transitional moment for this congregation, for me professionally, and for my family personally. Sometime in the coming week, I hope I will be able to announce where we're headed this summer. And I'll be honest, it's come as a bit of a surprise to me, this particular next location for hopefully the next decade of our lives. But to me, the very fact of it being a bit of a surprise, yet something that I do feel like I had a part in shaping, this is that combination that feels true to life. Something both out of my control, but with which I had the ability to pivot and appreciate. I threw my name into the search system this year because my spouse, Kathy, and I had gotten clear that we needed to leave the Hartford congregation. And I am excited to look ahead to serving one congregation full time in the immediate vicinity of where we will live. There are a lot of details I don't know yet and a lot of people I have yet to meet, but I am grateful for the feeling of living life fully and keeping myself open to possibility that feeling of shaping my story while simultaneously recognizing there is so much over which I do not have control. And open to possibility is the way I have experienced this congregation for all of my three years with you, trusting that something good will come out of unexpected change. Like Hurry the Turtle and the Monarch in our story for all ages today, we each experience change in our own way, at our own at our own pace, in our own context. The world is a place full of astonishing things. We each deal with the cold days in different ways. Even what feels like a cold day can vary for us. And how we go through change varies as well. I doubt any of us are going to break out of our shells, grow wings and fly away. But then again, who knows? Maybe you can already name a time when you metaphorically did just that. If so, I hope you'll share that with each other about that time during our post-service fellowship time today. I love the stories that you share with each other that we would have no way of knowing if you didn't offer up those stories otherwise. Sharing these stories of transformation, of dealing with change that may at first not have been what we wanted at all, those are really important stories of courage and resilience to share with each other. You inspire each other with your stories. You lift one another's spirits. And to me, that's a central part of what congregations are for. And this is central to our Unitarian Universalist faith. Our first source of wisdom is our own direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces that create and uphold life. The world is a place full of astonishing things. This past week, as I just begin to start to think about maybe paring down some of my vast personal library before transporting it all across state lines. I went to my Hartford office and pulled down the books of Buddhist nun Pema Chodron and Unitarian theologian Ralph Waldo Emerson, personal classics. I have my mom's old worn beat up paperback copy of Emerson's collected works. Later at home, perusing my mother's copy, transported me into a lovely afternoon nap. The first daytime nap I can remember taking in months and months. So I won't be quoting for you from Emerson today. Even though I'm amazingly talented at keeping books and newspapers and articles and magazines around for seriously years, it is often reading the newspaper on my phone these days that lands in my heart with the most resonance and immediacy. So it was yesterday morning when I read Wheaton College professor Esau Macaulay's column in the New York Times. Macaulay is a New Testament professor and the author of the book, Reading While Black, African-American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope. His article on the unsettling power of Easter 
is an excellent short read. And I think I can multitask here just for a second and share that link with you. He concludes with this resounding call for all of us to listen to the plans of some. After the pandemic, we are returning to a world of parties and rejoicing. This is true. Parties have their place. Let us not close all paths to happiness. But we are also returning to a world of hatred, cruelty, division, and a thirst for power that was never quarantined. This period under pressure has freshly thrown into relief the fissures in the American experiment. As we leave the tombs of quarantine, a return to normal would be a disaster unless we recognize that we are going back to a world desperately in need of healing. For Macaulay, the source of that healing is an empty tomb in Jerusalem. The work that Jesus left his followers to do includes showing compassion and forgiveness and contending for a just society. It involves the ever-present offer for all to begin again. Macaulay has experienced in the Black church that there are two Easter's that struggle alongside each other. One is linked closely to the celebration of spring and the possibility of new beginnings. It is the show that can be church on Easter. I loved John's description earlier of his first Easter UU experience. The other Easter, Macaulay writes, deals with the disturbing prospect that God is present with us. His power breaks out and unsettles the world. And I love that description as well. The idea that God is present among us in our power to disrupt and unsettle the world as it is. Even if in the broad theological spectrum that is the Unitarian Universalist lexicon, we call God the unknown or that which is beyond our control, even then we can still collectively acknowledge the courage that we all need to cultivate in ourselves, in one another, and in our communities to continually engage each day with this combination of truths. There is so much that is out of our control, but we are not helpless either. We have room to act, to shape our stories, to shape the collective story of our communities and our world. And our time to do so begins and re-begins today with each new change in our life that calls us into being engaged, into being alive, into being a part of this astonishing whirling world we are so blessed to be with. Let us be about the work of showing compassion and forgiveness and contending for a just society. Let us recommit each day and this Easter day especially to embracing the world we are in and acting with gratitude that we are able to do our part. May it be so. Join me now in the spirit of meditation and prayer. As a special treat for this day, I want to share with you my colleague, Reverend Julia Hamilton's words written last year for Easter with deep appreciation to the poet E.E. E. Cummings. She writes, drawing on Cummings' poem, it's Easter morning and I'm here and you're there and somewhere between us are flowers and above us the true blue dream of sky and underneath us the illimitable earth breathing as she always does in cycles of death and rebirth, everything that is holy, which is everything, stands between me and you, the infinite of all existence. The great happening is happening all around us. That is to say, my distant friend, life is happening and the sun is rising again over us all. I am a human merely being in these 
times of pandemic and spring, and the leaping green gathers for one more attempt to remind me that yes is still always an answer ready to be spoken. Yes is still always an answer ready to be spoken. May we say yes together to this chaotic world and let us all take a deep breath together and then join in singing with Jerry, Spirit of Life. Now it is time for us to extinguish our chalices. And please join me in our shared declaration. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. Our closing hymn today will be taught and sung by Reverend Suzelle Lynch. Now let us learn, now let us sing. Our song is hymn number 368, Now Let Us Sing, by an anonymous composer. This is a two-part zipper song, which means that only one word changes in each verse. There are two parts. I'm going to sing the first part twice. And then we'll add the second part. Now let us sing, 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 sing. And that line repeats. And then the next line is, lift up your voice, be not afraid. Now let us sing to the power of the faith within. And the second part is, sing to the power of the faith within. Sing to the power of the faith within. Lift up your voice, be not afraid. Let us sing to the power of the faith within. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Now let us sing, 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 sing. Now let us sing, 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 sing. Lift up your voice, be not afraid. Let us sing to the power of the Faith within. Now let us sing, 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 sing. Now let us sing, 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 sing. Lift up your voice, be not afraid. Let us sing to the power of the faith within. Now let us sing, sing to the power of the hope within. Now let us sing, sing to the power of the hope within. Lift up your voice, lift up your voice. Be not afraid, be not afraid. Let us sing to the power of the hope within. Now let us sing, sing to the power of the love within. Now let us sing, sing to the power of the love within. Lift up your voice, lift up your voice. 
afraid. Be not afraid. Now let us sing to the power of the love within. Now let us sing. Sing to the power of the joy within. Now let us sing. Sing to the power of the joy within. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Let us sing to the power of the joy within. I do love the ways that this pandemic and all the recording we've been doing and all the ways that people can connect from Florida and all the other places where you are today just remind us how interconnected we always were. And now we can realize that in so many beautiful ways. It's really fun. And I look forward to continuing to be connected with you all from afar in the years to come. Now let us sing to the power of the hope within. I love that. Following the postlude, please stay with us for breakout groups if you'd like. And if you're heading off into the rest of whatever this Easter Sunday holds for you during the postlude is a good time to do that. We'll imagine you out hiding or hunting for eggs, whatever your fancy is today. Let Reverend Julia Hamilton's words linger in your heart. I am a human merely being in these times of pandemic and spring. And the leaping green gathers for one more attempt to remind me that yes is still always an answer ready to be spoken. May you go with love in your heart, your spirit nourished by peace, your actions committed to creating greater justice in our shared world. Thank you.